not the absence of turmoil, but the presence of tranquility, even while in a place of chaos. It is a sense of wholeness and completeness that is content knowing that God controls the events of the day. Question. Do you find yourself frazzled by the crashing waves of turmoil in your life? Or are you experiencing the peace that passes all comprehension? Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Chad Bryan. I am the associate pastor and proud student ministries pastor at Grace Fellowship Half Moon. It's great to be here today. Thank you for coming to church today. Uh, we are continuing our series called Growing Up in Christ, in which we've been talking about what it looks like for a person to live a life that's filled and fueled by the Spirit of God. The evidence of the Spirit of God working in our lives is what we call the fruits of the Spirit, and the fruit that we're talking about today is peace. There's no question that peace is something that's called out for and desired in our world today. And uh, though many people cry out and desire peace, what exactly that peace looks like is up for conversation. Uh, I've learned in my, my study of this topic that while few people agree on what peace is, many people agree on what peace is not. For example, when you think globally, you think about the Middle East, and we think that's not peace. You think of a place like France that experienced a truck driver terrorizing innocent parents and children, and we know that's not peace. You think of what we heard of recently in Germany, Munich, where several teenagers and more included gunned down in a mall. We know that's not peace. You think about it nationally in our own country, officers being murdered in cold blood. That's not peace. Or uh, many of our, of our African-American brothers and sisters who, who fear being mistreated or even oppressed, we know that's not peace. To bring it to a more personal level, uh, when you lie awake at night, overwhelmed by uh, the financial burdens or the relational turmoil or the, the daily obligations you're reminded of when you have to shut that alarm clock off every morning, or then you look into the mirror and, and you see the big dark bags underneath your eyes and, and you hear yourself think or maybe even utter the hopeless words of, I don't know how I can do this anymore. I'm so burnt out. I don't know how I'm going to make it through today. You know that's not peace. So what is peace? Because the primary definition of the word peace is more about what peace isn't rather than what peace is. A basic definition of the word peace is that peace is the absence of war or turmoil. So what is peace? And to, to stick with the context of our series, what is the kind of peace that the Holy Spirit brings believers? You see, if we want to experience the peace that comes from trusting Jesus, then we need to first understand that the peace of Jesus is different than the peace that we're most familiar with. The peace of Jesus is different uh, than the peace that we are most familiar with. Uh, when I had, I found out I had the privilege of speaking with you today on the topic of peace. Uh, like you, I had a general understanding uh, uh, no matter your spiritual background, you probably share with me a general understanding that Jesus is probably pro-peace, right? Jesus, you, you might assume, wants every kid to get a trophy or catch a Pokemon, right? Jesus likes, likes peace. And so as I started to dig into the scriptures, one of the, the verses that I first stumbled upon was this quote from Jesus that says, he says this in Luke chapter 12, verse 51, he says, do you think I came to bring, 
Uh, peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. Well, that's not good, I thought. It kind of stinks when Jesus seems to be ruining your sermon for that weekend. I, I wondered maybe uh, if Jesus could send a text message out to Pastor Rex, let him know the sermon's going to look a little different than what we thought. Maybe by this verse alone, I, I thought Jesus would like us to retitle uh, the, the talk today, How to Stay Firm in Division, Not Peace. All right, you bring all your friends. Gr- great, great message to bring your friends to. But as I began to look at the other scriptures, which is the proper way to interpret scripture, by the way, and not just take a verse out of context, I realized that what Jesus is talking about here is he's talking about circumstantial peace. Uh, basically what he's saying to his disciples at the time, he, he's saying, Hey guys, if you think that I came to make all of your circumstances better in life, I I I I didn't. Although things are getting much better in a way, but but actually, uh, because you've chosen to follow me, some of the people, for example, who you love the most, might turn against you. Uh, You're going to face opposition and division. So rather than banking on everything just getting better, I would actually expect some things to get worse. Not everything's bad for a believer at all, okay? But the kind of peace that Jesus offers isn't tied to circumstances. It's greater than circumstances. We see this later on uh, when Jesus' uh, relationship is even further developed with these disciples. And we, find, uh, we fast forward to a conversation uh, between him and his disciples uh, in John chapter 14. And it's just a really bad night for everybody. Historically, we know that the next night, Jesus is going to go to the cross, okay? Next day, Jesus is going to go to the cross, and he's going to literally take on hell itself. The disciples are terrified because they think they're going to experience hell themselves without their fearless leader. All they know is that Jesus is going somewhere, and they can't follow him. So they are terrified. It's terrible circumstances, dire situation. And this is Jesus being Jesus. This is what Jesus says to them. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, the peace of Jesus isn't circumstantial Peace. And here's what I mean when I say circumstantial peace. Circumstantial peace is when we think, when my circumstances get better, peace will come. Um, Once I find that job, I'll have peace. Uh, Once I find that person to date or to marry, I'll have peace. Once my boss stops acting like a moron, I'll have peace. Once my spouse begins to act like they should, once my child, Lord knows, act like they could, I'll have peace. That is circumstantial peace. The peace of Jesus is greater than circumstances. He says to the disciples in this, again, dire situation, he says, uh, do not, I, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. If I turn this verse in a positive way, Jesus is saying, let your hearts be calm and confident. Why in the world, given the dire situation, would the disciples' hearts be calm and confident? Well, simply put, they have no reason other than just to trust the fact that Jesus knows what he's doing. So here's what I think Jesus is getting at. You see, the peace of Jesus isn't circumstantial, but we experience the peace of Jesus when our hearts are calm and confident in the promises of God. That's when we experience the peace of Jesus, when our hearts are calm and confident in the promises of God. And we have many reasons to be calm and confident in the promises of God. So many promises to trust in. We have the promise uh, that we can find salvation in Jesus. We have the promise that this life is just a pit stop and it's the life after this life where, it, where it, it really gets going for us. We have the promise that we'll spend eternity with Jesus, that one day we'll live without a sin-stained body in a sin-stained world. 
We have the promise that God lives in us right now and he'll never leave us. We have the promise that God cares about us and is always taking care of us. We have so many promises of God through Jesus that we can find our calm and confidence in despite the circumstances. So knowing that the peace of Jesus is when we are calm and confident in the promises of God, you might be thinking, okay, I, I get that. Like, all right, that's, so that's what peace is, all right. But what does it do? What role does it play? Because some of us, to be honest, rather have wit, grit, and determination in our lives more than we would peace. We'd rather just get stuff done. What's the point of peace? What does it do? And the answer to that is that the peace of God gives us spiritual stability. You see, believers stand firm in the peace of God. Believers stand firm in the peace of God. Life is hard. Circumstances are inconsistent. Opposition is constant, right? Life is a doozy, man. It's tough. Some of us had a hard time just getting our kids fitted in that car or car seat and getting them to church today. Not to mention paying bills, coping, learning how to cope with grief and tragedy. Life's tough. Paul knows that. And in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about how we can take on the battles of life. Spiritually speaking, he talks about putting on what we call, and he calls, spiritual armor. And specifically, when it comes to the peace of God, he says whether or not we experience peace is dependent on whether or not we put on the proper shoes. Sounds weird. Here's what he's saying, Ephesians chapter 6. He says, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news. Now, good news is the promises of God, not only the promise of salvation through Christ, but also of eternal life that we can begin experiencing right now, okay? So put on the peace, the, the, the shoes of peace, that comes from the good news, the promises of God, so that you will be fully prepared. Well, prepared for what? When we put on our shoes of peace, we are fully prepared to take on all circumstances and all opposition. A Roman soldier in ancient biblical culture wore a shoe that's very similar to what many athletes wear today. It was a type of cleat. Underneath the shoe were spikes. The purpose of the spikes was to give the soldier the ability to have stability and stand firm in all circumstances and against all opposition. If a soldier didn't have the proper shoes, he'd be slipping and sliding all over the place and would lose a major advantage. So it was absolutely pivotal for a soldier to make sure he had the proper shoes on. Some of us today, I think it's, it might be worth us asking whether or not we have on our shoes of peace. Because some of us can only stay stable and experience the peace of God in certain circumstances. For example, you come to church today and, 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 it, and it seems like you're, you have stability in the peace of God. You can stand firm in the peace of God. But then you go back home and the house is ruled by stress and turmoil. It's almost like your, your children or spouse can taste it in the air. Others of you, you seem to have stability in the peace of God when you're with your small group or a certain group of friends. But then you go back to the workplace and you're slipping and sliding all over the place. As some of us, we really believe that we have the, the peace of God, but, but then circumstances just took such a sharp turn for us, and we're knocked off a place of stability by anger, frustration, bitterness, worry. But the shoes of peace enable us to stand firm in the peace of God no matter the circumstances and against all opposition, and you better believe we have opposition. You see, in case you need the reminder, like I do all the time, our relationship with God isn't just, you know, God and, and us, but there's someone who totally opposes us, more than the person that you recently blocked from your cell phone contacts. There's someone who hates you, 
and me, not just you, who, who wants to make sure that we never experience this kind of true peace. And of course, that's the devil himself. You see, the enemy, the evil one, wants to make sure that we continue to pursue circumstantial peace because he knows that if, if we keep pursuing uh, a peace in, in, in our romantic partner, in our success at work, in entertainment or Netflix binging, he knows that we'll continue to slip and slide all over the place and we'll never be able to regain our spiritual stability and become an effective laborer for the kingdom of God. So the peace of God is what gives us spiritual stability. Believers stand firm in the peace of God. The peace of God is different than the peace that we're most familiar with. And the peace of God gives us the ability to stand firm. But now you might be wondering, okay, how do I stand firm in the peace of God? How do we put on these shoes, lace them up, and dig our spikes into the ground, if you will, and stand firm? in all circumstances, against all opposition. Well, in Philippians chapter four, Paul gets into the nitty gritty of what it looks like to stand firm in the peace of God in day-to-day life. We referenced uh, a few of these verses last week, all locations did when we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, joy, and rightfully so, because joy and peace are so interconnected. I'd actually say that peace is the bridge that leads to the city of joy. They're so intertwined with one another. But in Philippians chapter four, when Paul gets into what it looks like to stand firm in the peace of God on a day-to-day basis, Out of all the things he could address, he first addresses relational conflict in the church. And I don't know why, because that's not a thing in 2016, right? We can stand firm in the peace of God by striving for peace with one another. This is the situation he addresses here. He says, I plead with Yodia, I plead with Sintiki, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Now, these women, not only are they uh, great names to remember for you expecting parents out there, all right, but they're very popular. They're very popular because of, because of their role in the church and their previous role in the ministry uh, with Paul. But despite their popularity, uh, they're causing a lot of division in the church because these two women have a beef with one another. And rather than this beef being hashed out and put away, the beef is being left out and everyone's smelling it. You see, the, the problem isn't that they have conflict. The problem is that they're not striving for peace in their conflict. Conflict's not new to Grace Fellowship Church or any other church or any other group of people who have ever met for any kind of period of time, right? As long as we're committed to going through life together and living out our faith with one another, we are committed to doing conflict together. And it's not hard to find it, is it? All it takes is a Facebook post. Hey, let people know who you're voting for and ask them what they think. All it takes is a misinterpreted email or a misunderstood text or a text with the wrong emoji or a text with no emojis. You can find this conflict in your small group. You can find conflict with the lead pastor. You uh, you can find a a conflict with your best friend who was your best friend three best friends ago. uh, The world is abounding with opportunity for conflict. Conflict's not necessarily the problem, but if we're going to stand firm in the peace of God, we need to go into conflict striving for peace with one another. Now, you might be here today, and uh, you might say, uh, I'm in conflict with someone right now. That's why I'm kind of slipping and sliding. That's why I don't really have the peace of God, doesn't feel like, because I'm in conflict right now. And if that's you, I want to say, one, thank you for doing life with people. And also I want to mention a verse that Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. He says, Paul says, if it's possible, 
as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you. So if you're slipping and sliding because of a relational conflict right now, I'd encourage you, one, to notice the kind of high esteem and respect and the dignity that Paul gives Euodia and Syntyche despite the mess they're causing. We would do well to emulate that. And secondly, Paul asked for a third party to get involved here. And so if you're stuck in a conflict, I would encourage you, just a practical uh, encouragement, is to get that person in your life who's willing to tell you what you don't want to hear and, and ask them, uh, off of, stemming off of this verse, hey, in your mind, what do you think is the next step in me striving to make peace with this person? Now, there might be someone here today who says, well, I, I'm, really, I'm never in conflict. My response is, let me clarify what I mean by conflict. I don't mean lawsuits and fistfights necessarily, although it could look like that. I'm talking about also disagreements, frustrations, miscommunications, right? Different stances on things. And if you've never experienced that, this is what I'd encourage you to do. Before you leave today, sign up for a ministry team or a small group and start doing life with people. The third person might be the person who says, I left the church because of conflict. If that's you, you may not be here today. But maybe uh, you'll listen online, or maybe uh, you'll see this message at some point in time, but here's what I'd like to encourage you with. One, I want to say I'm sorry, even though you're, you may not be looking for an apology from me. Uh, secondly, I, I want you to prayerfully consider something. Be careful not to misidentify the opponent. You see, the opponent isn't the pastor who hurt you. Our, our opponent isn't believers or, or, or people or the organization or structure of the church. Our opponent is the evil one who wants to rob us from standing firm in peace. So I'd encourage you to make sure that the evil one doesn't win. And to consider this time to be a time of healing, forgiveness, as you strive for peace. Because we can stand firm in the peace of God when we strive for peace with one another. Listen, the peace of God isn't just a me and God thing. It's a we and God thing. It is highly relational. And it's also highly personal. You see, we stand firm in the peace of God by striving for peace with one another, but also by gratefully giving our anxieties to God. Uh, The Lord knows, as do you and I, that our conflict isn't just external conflict with one another, right? But a lot of our conflict when it comes to not experiencing the peace of God is internal right between our ears, right in our very own hearts, Right? We, we battle internal conflict all the time. Paul knows this, so when he's talking about how to stand firm in the peace of God, he addresses this right away in Philippians 4, verse 6. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Now, stop there. Keep this verse on the screen. If your mind is already going to the next verse, the verse behind it, I'm glad Casey trained you well. I'm glad your Bible studies are paying off, okay? But take a chill pill for a second and recognize how absurd this is. Are you kidding me? Do not be anxious about anything. That's like asking me not to breathe or use the restroom today. I'm almost getting, if you can't tell, I'm getting anxious about not being allowed to get anxious. It's all ages. It's like asking, uh, uh, telling a, a crying child to stop crying, right? I just want to worry more. When I was in college, I struggled with something called OCD. It wasn't OCD for cleanliness. I'm sure the guys on my dorm floor would have appreciated that. 
and so would my current Brian household. But I struggled with a high anxiety all the time because I would constantly imagine the worst case scenarios of, of nearly everything. And so um, whether I was in the classroom or whether I was uh, at work or in the gym or, I don't know, maybe even on a date or something in the dorm room, I, I would be tormented by anxiety. I, I felt at, at one point paralyzed by it. I can think of dark moments in my dorm room trying to pray off the anxiety. I can think of several conversations with professors trying to work through the anxiety. And the reason I share this with you isn't just to air my dirty laundry, although I do hope you appreciate that. The reason I'm sharing this with you is because I know many of you, factually, who aren't on stage could nearly relate with me entirely. You know what it's like to be buried by anxiety. You know what it's like to have uh, consistent, uh, discouraging thoughts. You know what it's like to have bouts of depression. You know what it's like to maybe even have suicidal contemplations. In fact, I, I feel like if I asked everyone to come up on stage who can relate with this, I don't know if anyone would be left in their seats. It's so normal, it's so natural, it's such a common struggle. But what Paul's talking about here is what's supernatural. He's talking about living a spirit-filled life. And he goes on to say that this is what it looks like. He says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In every situation, by prayer and petition, Petition. Now, if I, asked, if I asked you today, this is hypothetical, rhetorical, okay, so don't put your hand in the air. But if I asked you, hey, put your hand in the air if you feel like you're an awesome person of prayer. I feel like few people would raise their hands and everyone else would try not to judge you, right? But if I asked you, hey, put your hands in the air, loud and proud, high in the sky, if you are awesome at worrying, if you are a professional worrier, you have your honorary doctorate in anxiety, I feel like it'd be a strong response. Here's the thing. Uh, you may not be very good at prayer, but if you're really good at worrying, then you're off to a great start in your new prayer life. You may not be good at prayer, but if you're good at worrying, you're off to a great start in your new prayer life. I hope that's encouraging for you this morning as it is for me. Uh, Paul says that we take those worries and we give them away to God. You see, living a spirit-filled life doesn't mean that our worries go away because they don't, but it means that we become better in giving them away. It doesn't mean, living the spirit filled life doesn't mean that our words go away, it means that we become more intentional in giving them away to God. And we can do so gratefully with thanksgiving because God cares about our worries. Sometimes I hear in life people who, who, who say uh, uh, in one way or, or the other, hey, the big man in the sky, he's probably got bigger and better things to be worried about than, than this, you know, and such and such. And I think most of the time they are dead wrong. You see, through the Holy Spirit, we have the uncompromised presence of God in our lives. And because we have the uncompromised presence of God in our lives, we can be assured that God has a comprehensive concern for our lives. He's with us 24-7. He cares about us 24-7. He cares. And because he cares, we can gratefully share. It's not that our words go away. It's that we give them away. And when we do, Scripture says that we will have a, the peace of God which transcends all understanding that that's what we'll experience. We'll experience the peace of God that transcends all understanding. Now this might, the, the peace that transcends all understanding, it might refer to a, somewhat of a euphoric sense of, man, I feel so good, I, I can't even explain it. But I, I think that Paul is getting a little bit more uh, practical 
here. I, I think uh, what, what Paul is saying is, hey, w- whatever solution you get by using your own wit, grit, and determination, when you're stressed out and, and you're lying awake at night trying to find the solutions to your anxiety, or you're leaning your, 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 your forehead up against the shower wall, or, or you're thinking all day at work about your, your worries, whatever you conjure up in your own understanding won't be as good, won't be as peaceful as the peace that God will offer you when you give your anxieties to him. Here's why the peace of God is so much better than what we conjure up in our own wit, grit, and determination. And by the way, that's not to belittle wit, grit, and determination. Life takes hard work. It's a grind, right? And you know that you could be here today, just to encourage many of you, me included, you could be here today with bags underneath your eyes and be physically worn down and still be experiencing the peace of God. You know why? Because you're giving away your anxieties to him. And here's why that peace, even in your fatigue maybe, is so much better than your own solutions. Because scripture says that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. The biblical imagery for guarding our hearts and minds is one of a battalion of soldiers guarding a force or a, a fort, pardon me, or a base. The biblical imagery is, is a, one of battalion of soldiers guarding a fort or a base. You see, the peace of God isn't some weak, flimsy, emotional thing. It's a tough, sturdy, get the job done kind of thing. You see, when God guards our hearts, he does the job that only he's fit for. You know why you and I stress? We stress because we're constantly trying to tackle problems that we don't have the capacity or qualifications to handle. But when we give away our anxieties to God, God takes on a job that only he's qualified for. He's bigger, better, smarter, and mistake-free. And so he's occupying a position that only he's qualified to occupy. So when we go from living the, the, the flesh life, if you will, as Pastor Rex has kind of delineated, to the spirit-filled life, we go by the flesh of giving 0%, if you will, of our worries to God, to now striving to give 100% of our worries to God. And when we do that, we go from, in the flesh, worrying 100% of the time to start worrying less and less because we're giving away our anxieties to him. And when we do this, when we let God do his job, we are now freed up to do ours. Because we stand firm in the peace of God, not only in striving for peace with one another, not only in gratefully giving our anxieties to him and letting him do his job so that we can do ours in which it's we stand firm in the peace of God by constantly thinking and doing good. By constantly thinking and doing good. Uh, Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. This is what I used to think this verse meant, these verses meant. I used to think these verses meant that when we give our anxieties away to God, we can now focus on more positive, spiritual, heavenly things, which is a major part of the application. But I do think that's an incomplete application. Here's why. Paul gives two practical exhortations in these verses. Paul says, one, think about such things. Think. Two, he says, put into practice. Do. Paul says, don't just think, but do. Don't just do, but think. Think and do. Well, what are we freed up when we give away our anxieties to God? What are we freed up to think and do? Well, we're freed up to think and do whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, what, if anything, whatever is praiseworthy or excellent. Think and do. Generally speaking, when a soldier stands firm, 
A soldier isn't just standing firm, waiting for opposition to come, right? A soldier, generally speaking, is standing firm. They got their boots and, and spikes, you know, dug into the ground, standing firm, carrying on the assigned role of the overarching mission they're to take on, right? They're carrying out a mission at the same time being prepared for opposition. Our mission as believers and standing firm in the peace of God is, is said in Scripture that believers were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's our overarching mission. That's what we carry out. Now, you might think, what does that look like? What, what does it look like to think and do good things, to carry out our mission of doing good works? Because that's what it looks like to stand firm in the peace of God. Well, this is what it looks like. You, you might think, is that as simple, Chad, as, as, I don't know, bringing brownies into work tomorrow? I love how many times Paul uses the word whatever in these verses. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything, whatever is praiseworthy or excellent, whatever. So Chad, um, is this a symbol of thinking and doing good? I mean, bringing brownies into work tomorrow? Yes, whatever. Well, it's, it's Chad, is, is this like, I, I don't know, like I, me sitting out encouraging text or something on my way home? Yes, whatever. Uh, I don't know, should I like volunteer at a homeless shelter? Is that thinking and doing good? Yes, whatever. Uh, should I visit the elderly? Yes, whatever. Should I sign up for a ministry? Yes, whatever. Student ministries? Absolutely. Yes, whatever. Should I stop by, uh, check out the Grace in Action website, see where maybe I could fit in and, and serve the community? Yes, Whatever, by the way, isn't it great that grace and action is called grace and action, not grace and thought? I just point that out there. Action, thinking and doing, yes, absolutely. When we stand firm in the peace of God, when we stand firm in the peace of God, we can constantly strive to think and do good in whatever way in the world that we live in every day. That's what it looks like. We stand firm in the peace of God for, by striving for peace with one another, by gratefully giving our anxieties to God, and by constantly thinking and doing good in whatever way in the world we live in every day. So here's the question. Church, are we standing firm in the peace of God? Is there someone that you need to reach out to and make peace with, because that, that's what has you slipping and sliding right now. Is it time, maybe, for you to finally take God at his promise and, and be willing to give away your anxieties to him so that he can do his job of guarding your heart, and you could do yours, of constantly striving for thinking and doing good in and, and whatever way in the world we live in every day. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I've never really experienced the peace of God. And maybe that's because you've never had peace with God. And here's what I, I want to encourage you with today. You could experience this peace of God right now just as much as anyone else. By beginning to trust in the promises of God. That's called faith. Trusting in the promises of God, that's faith. Being calm and confident in those promises is what we call peace. Peace. To experience the peace of God takes great intentionality. Every day, it takes a conscious decision to put on our shoes of peace, dig our spikes in the ground, and stand firm in the peace of God, no matter the circumstances, no matter the opposition. Church, we live in a world today that's wondering, what is peace? And as a church, we are called by God to show the world who the God of peace looks like. In the first century church, they were surrounded by a chaotic culture just like us, a culture full of racial tension, of different religious backgrounds, 
uh, convictions and, and preferences and, and different socioeconomic gaps of all kinds. And yet it was the church who showed, who modeled to the world what it looked like when a group of people came together bridged by the peace of God. The church did it then. We can do it again. Imagine what this church will look like when we're no longer buried in our own personal anxieties, insecurities, or fear, no longer sidetracked by our frictions and conflicts with other people, but we are focused on constantly thinking and doing good in whatever way in the world we walk into every day. That's what it looks like to stand firm in the peace of God. We stand firm in the peace of God when the peace of God stands firm in us, let's share this peace with our world. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your peace. We want your peace. And not the kind of circumstantial peace that we're most familiar with. Forgive us for looking for peace in the wrong places. We ask that you'd enable our hearts to be calm and confident in your promises. That we'd become experts in giving away our anxieties to you so that you could do your job and we can do ours by bringing hope to our world as a spirit-filled church, constantly thinking and doing good. Jesus, we are committed to standing firm in you May your peace stand firm in us. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.